Welcome. Everybody have an uneventful journey this morning? Yeah. That's good news. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, I want to say uh, a warm welcome to everyone, and I'm grateful to Roger Castonier, uh, who is the chair of the committee who put this uh, event together, and the, his volunteers, and uh, I truly want to say thank you to Roger and, and the team. I also want to say uh, a wonderful thank you to uh, Archdeacon Barrett for uh, hosting this event. I know that the uh, hospitality shown to us yesterday, um, I, I want you to know you're going to have a great day here uh, in, in, in Sussex. So thank you, uh, David and, and, and crew. And uh, I want to tell you that we've got over 200 registered for our event. And that's... I know that uh, had we had a little more lead time, I know that there was some folks who uh, uh, would want to be here and just couldn't be for whatever reason. And so uh, I know that you will take what learning you uh, gained here and take it back to your parishes. And I know that it will be uh, wonderful for all uh, at the parish level. I also want to say a welcome to Bishop Sam. You've, there's been a lot of press and uh, a lot of advertising about his presence with us. And he was with us at our clergy uh, uh, conference in, in, in Rossi uh, just over a year ago. And uh, so I welcome uh, Bishop Salmon and uh, uh, his unselfish uh, gift to us. Um, he was in Washington yesterday morning, or the day before, and I uh, picked him up at the airport uh, in the evening, on, uh, on uh, Thursday evening, and uh, then from Fredericton. And, He's back to uh, Fredericton this, after, er, this afternoon, uh, and he's at uh, St. Mary's uh, on Sunday morning, and then back to Washington. And he's looking after parishes, of which he's going to tell you about, I'm sure. And as you recall, our 2009 Synod recommended a strategy for transformational change in our diocese. And it's hoped that this event will serve to support, serve to support the vision of our Synod, <coughs> and our clergy and lay leadership in your parishes. We pray that our learning will assist our parishes in setting ministry and mission priorities in these challenging and indeed changing times. Our synod recognized that stewardship is a priority, but as Bishop Salmon said, stewardship is boring. <laughs> stewardship is boring. What's exciting, he says, is being engaged by a vision of the gospel. It has been said, a genuine conversion to stewardship means seeing everything differently with new eyes and acknowledging that everything we have does come from God as gifts to be cared for responsibly and shared generously with others. Our new vision for sharing and generosity will, we pray, enable the bringing of the good news to people both near and far. The success of this day and time together in conversation depends on how our learning is translated at the parish level. We're enormously grateful for the generosity of those who have gone before that to a very large extent has laid the foundation for our present day and our future. We pray that the leadership of the parish level and the response of every member will serve to herald in that new day where God's mission is embraced anew. It is my prayer that this event will help our parishioners to visualize, to see their gifts of time, talent, and treasure as serving God's mission called to serve in a new and exciting <coughs> reality. So I want to extend my thanks once again for the tremendous response to this diocese initiative, and please be assured of my prayerful support. As God's flock, we listen for the voice of the Good Shepherd to guide and direct us. And may this good work strengthen our families and strengthen our diocesan relationships. God bless you, and have a tremendous day. And Bishop Salmon, you're in care of the flock this day. Thank you.
like to express my appreciation to the Archbishop. You know, it takes a, a, a spirit of risk to ask an outsider to come into your diocese uh, and to uh, preside over events like this. And I described uh, for him as we were walking, uh, driving over from the motel that a number of years ago when we had founded the Anglican Institute and did conferences in England, uh, some clergy from the Diocese of Oxford persuaded uh, Bishop Harries to invite me to do their clergy conference. And in a weak moment, he agreed to do so. And so uh, when I went uh, to England and to Oxford, I spent the night uh, with the Harries. And it was perfectly clear to me that he had no idea what he had done. And he didn't know a thing in the world about me. And I was going to talk to his whole diocesan apparatus the next day. And I we had the most interesting evening while he investigated me like the CIA. <laughs> uh, but it, it was a great experience, I, I believe, for, for both of us. Uh, what I would uh, like to do is take a small passage from the Gospel according to St. Mark uh, and to form a prayer uh, around that uh, as we begin together. And the passage that I'm going to read to you is from the fourth chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark, and it's about the parable of the sower. And listen to what it says. When he was alone, those who were around him along with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But to those outside, everything comes in parables in order that they may indeed look and not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may not turn again and forgiven. What a strange beginning to that parable. Uh, and uh, just sitting where you are, let me say, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Uh, blessed Lord, in your holy word, you have said to us that to us, has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. Help us to know ever more deeply that the secret of the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, mounting the arms of the cross for you and for me and for the sins of the whole world, which runs in the face of everything that we understand about the omnipotence and majesty of God. Uh, but in that act of self-giving, when our eyes are open to see it and our ears are open to hear it, uh, we are able to see the world and the cosmos and everything in it in a different way through the eyes of the one who emptied himself, uh, who knew sin for us so that we might become through him the righteousness of God. As we gather together today, Father, help us to see the word made flesh mounting the arms of the cross, and that mystery that interprets and transforms all of life. And for that, we give you thanks in his name and for his sake, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, when I was given the topic of stewardship uh, to uh, talk about today, uh, I tried to put that subject uh, in a context that will root it in such a way as to empower you and, and me and the church. Uh, and so the theme <clears throat> for today, from my point of view in terms of stewardship, is building a congregational team for a new day. Building a congregational team for a new day. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about stewardship, but I want to talk to you about the stewardship of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's number one. Number two, the stewardship of the church and our ordained and lay leadership. And number three, the stewardship of money. And I want to talk to you about that in that order because I don't think the stewardship of money makes any sense unless it's set uh, in, in that order. Uh, and when I begin to think <clears throat> about our congregations today, uh, our congregations, no matter where they are, whether they're in the United States or in Canada or, or in New Brunswick. Uh, we're in a world that is changing dramatically. The demographics are changing. 
And one of the things that I hear and, and saw when I was here last and continue to hear is that the rural demographics uh, in New Brunswick are, Brunswick are changing dramatically. The, the economy uh, is changing. Uh, we live in a culture that has less and less place, uh, if you will, for the gospel and, and its understandings. And one of the things that we are about is what I would call the empowerment uh, of our parochial systems. And one of the things that we need to be careful about uh, is that we want to take the precious apparatus of the congregation and the diocese uh, that we have had all these centuries uh, and to take that apparatus uh, and to empower it rather than to let the mechanics of it weigh us down so that we can't do the work of the gospel uh, that we are called to do. And so the first thing that I want to do is engage the subject of the stewardship of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the situation that we find ourselves in uh, with the decline of the church and, and the various and sundry pressures, uh, it's very easy to lose the context. You know, for instance, when I was active in the parish ministry, I did a great deal of, of marital support and marital work. And one of the things that I saw over and over again were two people who married each other, loved each other profoundly, but over a period of years, something happened to the relationship. Uh, they grew to be strangers or things came between them. Uh, and instead of that relationship intentionally being fed day in and day out because of the pressure of children and circumstances and money and houses and jobs, the most precious thing in the world for them uh, by circumstance, got lost. And one of the things that can happen to the church is that, uh, you know, if you're the rector of a church like this, uh, there's something called maintenance. Uh, and uh, if you don't maintain it, uh, in, uh, in the diocese that I came from, we called it debt. Deferred maintenance is debt. Uh, you're in debt. Uh, and so there's the pressure of, of maintaining property. Uh, we live in a, a, a consumer culture where people think that, uh, that their opinion is the last word on, on any subject. Uh, we have wonderful congregations where people have been there for generations. I said to the clergy yesterday that I hope to go back to uh, Natchez, Mississippi, where my niece will have her baby baptized, and it'll be the sixth generation of my family baptized in that church. Now, one of the things that that does for me, even though I preach against it, uh, is instead of being a disciple there, I think I'm an owner. And, <laughs> and the last time I went, I walked right down to the third pew from the front on the gospel side and sat there. <laughs> I sat there as a child. My father and mother sat there. My grandmother sat there. Her father sat there. We own it. Uh, and so one of the wonderful things about, about things that are precious to us uh, is that things can change so subtly so that disciples become owners. Or if we've worked hard in our parish churches to keep the roof on and to, because we love the place, uh, matriarchs and patriarchs become owners. Uh, and it didn't come about because somebody sat down and said, you know, I'd like to be a matriarch or a patriarch. It happened out of faithfulness. It didn't happen for bad reasons. And so all kinds of things circumstantially uh, happen uh, in our church. Uh, and the main thing ceases to be the main thing. Uh, and what I'm trying to say to you all is that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the proclamation of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, is the main thing. Uh, that's what we are there about. We are drawn there because our Lord has drawn us there by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we gather around, if you will, this altar on which there's a cross, uh, and that cross symbolizes the love of God for you and for me. It's that cross on which Jesus Christ uh, climbed up, uh, if you will, because that's what the Gospel of John says when he says, uh, it is finished. It meant that the crucifixion was not a circumstantial event where something happened at the hands of dastardly people, but it said that Jesus was in charge of that and he mounted the arms of the cross which is saying to us uh, something about how deeply God loves you and me and how much we matter to him. 
Uh, and so when we begin to think about stewardship, one of the things that I think is so important in our congregations is the stewardship of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to root it, to give it, uh, to embed it in the hearts of the people who are there, uh, and to raise it up uh, from one generation to the next. Uh, and that stewardship is central uh, to the well-being and the vitality of every congregation. Uh, and uh, you don't need anybody to, you don't need to wait for anybody in order to do thing, anything about that. The good news is that the vitality of every congregation is in the hands of the people who are there. Now, we are a part of a larger community which can help support and empower that, uh, but we have, God has given us the tools where we are uh, to empower our congregations through the stewardship of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, of course, one of the things that happens to us is that, as I said, circumstances can rob us of that vitality. And so when I was talking to the clergy yesterday, uh, I described for them one of the things that I'm currently doing, uh, and that is uh, I have Episcopal oversight for two parishes in the Diocese of Washington, and in one of them I became the interim rector uh, on June the 17th. Uh, and so I'm talking to you not about theory, uh, but I'm talking to you about what I am currently doing. That is, I'm involved in the active life of a congregation. Uh, the only joke about it is that if I want to talk to the bishop, I have to get a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I don't trust his advice, so I'm in real trouble. <laughs> uh, at, at any rate, uh, that's a parish, a wonderful parish on Chevy Chase Circle in, uh, in Chevy Chase, uh, right at the edge of D.C., a large parish. Uh, and it's had some conflict because there are a lot of pressures and issues in the church and people are fighting about that. Uh, we have the last two rectors. The first one I sent to seminary and ordained. Uh, the one I just preceded had been a, the rector of St. James Church in, uh, in James Island. Uh, there was a presentment brought against the first rector because they accused him of wanting to take the church out of the Episcopal Church, the parish out of the Episcopal Church. And, of course, that wasn't true, and it took some time to, to deal with that. But you can imagine what happens in what I would call the ethos of a congregation where some people bring a charge against the rector, that kind of charge. Uh, and then um, the last rector who had retired as dean of Trinity Seminary in, in Pittsburgh and retired, and the parish called him uh, to be the rector, and he came for a year and a half and did a stunning job in teaching and preaching but he decided that he wanted to be retired uh, and not on the front line of these kinds of issues and things. Uh, and like a, a very foolish man, uh, I had asked him to stay for a while, and, and he did, and the commitment I made was that if he decided he couldn't stay, I would take over his interim for a while, little believing uh, that he would do it. Uh, <laughs> so um, what I'm trying to um, say to you is that I have inherited a congregation in which there are issues. Uh, I have a parish list when we look at it because it's a large parish, and I ask people about this name or that name, and they don't know, you know, whether they've gone to heaven or New Brunswick. Nobody knows where they are. Uh, and so we have, uh, we have all those, those issues before us. Uh, we have the, the business of dealing with the staff and all kinds of things. And so the question is, what do you then do? What do you do? There you are. Well... Uh, what I said to the clergy was, what I've done is I've started teaching the Scripture. Uh, and uh, when I was elected to be the rector of the Church of St. Michael and St. George in St. Louis in 1978, uh, it was a wonderful large parish that had probably lost almost half uh, of its membership. Uh, and uh, when I finally accepted the call the, the second time, uh, the wonderful senior warden, who was 85 years old, uh, said to me, Ed, uh, what are you going to do when you get here? And I said, Bob, I'm going to call on everybody here, and I'm going to start teaching the Scripture. And he said, oh, dear, we're too sophisticated for that. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you what a wonderful man he was. I arrived in November, and I started Bible classes in Lent, 
And he was on the front row of that Bible class until he died 10 years later. Uh, so he was not uh, the kind of person who didn't support uh, and learn, but on the front end, he didn't have the foggiest notion that there was any relationship between that and rebuilding uh, that congregation. And so what I started doing there was teaching the scripture. And somebody said, <clears throat> why did you do that? And I said, the reason I did that is I'm an Episcopalian, an Anglican. Does that make any sense to you? <laughs> How many of you all feel quite comfortable and conversant with the Holy Scripture? Okay, good. Why don't you all come up here and help me teach? This? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, what, I, what I'm driving at is that uh, <clears throat> I, I stu try to study the Scripture because I teach uh, almost every day. And I can tell you that at age 75, almost 76, I see things and hear things that I have never heard before. It never grows old. It never ceases to speak to you. Uh, and so uh, I began to teach the Scripture there. Uh, and uh, when I left to go to South Carolina as, as bishop, uh, I was teaching 11 classes a week. Uh, I had a wonderful staff so that I could do that, and I taught a class in the spring semester at Washington University. Uh, but what I can tell you is that when the people of God rooted themselves in the Scripture, things began to change because we saw things that we didn't see before. Uh, it changed the way the vestry functioned because they began to see themselves as disciples leading the church of God uh, and not as businessmen uh, running the church. Not that well, I didn't expect them to do good business, but you know there's a jingle that says, when is a businessman not a good businessman? When he becomes a vestry man. Uh, <laughs> Because decisions are made for the church of God that we wouldn't make for ourselves under any circumstances. And so one of the things that we began to see wasn't anything that I did, but it was something that was happening that the Spirit used, and that is as people's lives were rooted in the Scripture, you began to see a different understanding of things. You began to see what we prayed about here. Uh, as people began to see that God cared enough for us to be crucified for us, that produced a, a response that was very different from someone who thought they sat in Moses' seat. Uh, and so teaching the Scripture began to make a stunning difference there. And I think when we started out in, uh, in 79, we had somewhere around 900 parishioners, somewhere around that. Uh, and when we uh, finished our work together in 1989 and I went to South Carolina, we had over 3,000 members uh, and it came because people there would tell other people uh, about how their lives were blessed there. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't ask people to bring people to church. You don't want to frighten Anglicans. <laughs> what, you want to do, <clears throat> what you want to do is meet their needs. And if you meet their needs, they will go tell other people about it. Uh, I learned that when I got married at age 38. Uh, I lived in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I was the rector of the university parish. And my uh, wife came home one day. I was back over in the corner of the house where my little library was reading, and she slammed the door and came in and went and picked up the phone and must have called 10 people, and I thought somebody had died. Uh, and I went out and I said, Louise, what's going on? Uh, she said, Ed, Doris Perry is selling out her shop in the mall. Uh, and so, you know, you couldn't have hired her to advertise for Doris Perry. Uh, but she was meeting her needs and not mine, you see, and she was telling all the world about it. And so the, the principle that we used was, uh, if we bless the lives of the people who are here, they will tell everybody. And if we don't, we don't want them to tell anybody. Uh, and so the plan, what was the plan? to root people in the Word of God, uh, to draw people around the sacrament of the altar, uh, to draw people around a fellowship that deepens our relationship to God uh, and to each other. Uh, and one of the fundamental ways of doing that is getting in touch with who we are as God's people, getting in touch with the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf and mine. So what I've done at the 
uh, at All Saints Church on Chevy Chase Circle is I've begun to teach the scripture. And so at the end of the summer, I started a class on parables, the parables of Jesus. It's probably going to go for a year and a half or something like that by the time that we get through them. And there's a wonderful book uh, that I use that's now three books in one that was written by Robert Capon called The Parables of, the, of uh, Grace, The Parables of the Kingdom, and The Parables of Judgment. Uh, and it's a wonderful way of looking at the, uh, uh, at the parables of Jesus. And then on um, Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock, uh, I have a Bible class. And on Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock, uh, I have a Bible class. And I live right next door to the church. And so sleepy or not, I can roll right over and, uh, uh, and, and we can begin. And so what we've done in the two weekday Bible classes is we've started with the epistle to the Ephesians. And uh, the reason I've started with the epistle to the Ephesians is that I think the message there uh, is what we need to hear today. Uh, in the midst of all the controversy in the church, in the midst of the f fact that the church has declined uh, and, uh, and the ways we are suffering economically and, and attendance-wise, et cetera, uh, what we need to do is get re-rooted uh, in the power to transform that. Uh, so that we can use the grace of God and the power of God to do the work that it will do if we simply get out of the way and make it possible. So we've been reading the epistle to the Ephesians uh, as a warrant, if you will, uh, to, uh, for the church to hear as the basis for our new work together. And we're going to continually refer to that. And so I'd just like to read a little portion uh, of that scripture to you this morning. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. Think about what he's saying to folks who might be discouraged or who feel like they've got a heavy burden to lift. Uh, this passage is really going to say, Wake up and count your blessings. For heaven's sakes, you've lost touch uh, with the very fundamental power and blessing that God has given to every one of us, and, and nobody can take that away. Uh, we had a baptism uh, two Sundays ago, and I remember uh, when the, uh, the young priest who works with me sealed the person who was baptized and, uh, and said, Darian, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Nobody can take that away from you. It's, it's that foundation upon which we stand. How is it that we forget that? It's not hard uh, because, because it happens. But a congregation needs a stewardship of the gospel to be continually fed uh, by, by, its, by its power. He destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ. Think about that. According to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. You know, I was thinking about that in terms of uh, now that I've gotten old, uh, thinking about what my father did for me and for my brother and my sister because he was a remarkable man. And one of the things that I think I could say to him about him as I think back on that relationship, is that he did one thing for me uh, that is the most precious thing in the world, and that is he blessed me. And you know, sometimes in families, you'll see a father give the unconscious notion that if you don't succeed, you're not what you ought to be. I never got that message from my father. My father said, you are mine, uh, and we love you, and there's nothing that can ever stand in the way of that. You see, it's that promise that says God has chosen us and adopted us, that says nothing will ever stand in the way of that. Romans says that, for I am persuaded that neither height nor depth nor angels nor principalities nor life nor death nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. A congregation and the members of the congregation and the ordained leadership of the congregation need to be stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to know its scripture, uh, to worship faithfully, uh, to fellowship together so that we might grow in grace and relationship with each other and God. 
And when we talk about stewardship, if that stewardship is not in place, it is absolutely pointless to talk about the stewardship of money because you need to get to fundraising. And in fundraising, what you do is you go to somebody and say, uh, I'm going to give uh, $10,000, $50,000. Uh, I want you to match or do this. In other words, in the, in the secular world, when we're looking for big money, that's the way we go about it. Uh, but what we're about in the gospel of Jesus Christ is something entirely different. We might tell somebody what we're giving, but we'll get into that later on. Uh, <clears throat> at any rate, uh, as we read on, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us, the forgiveness, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Can you imagine any other body that you can belong to where you can get a clean bill of health any day? All we have to do is ask God for forgiveness, and it's there. It, it's, uh, you can't buy it. Uh, this is the place of new life, uh, and we stand. And when we stand on that gospel, uh, we have a vitality uh, that is strictly the uh, gift of the Holy Spirit. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as the plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. Think about that. Already gotten the inheritance on the front end, and nobody can take that away from us. Uh, and one of the questions that I asked the clergy uh, when we were thinking about the stress of leadership uh, in the church today, uh, is it possible to deeply see the love of God in Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected and be discouraged? The answer is yes when we don't see it very well. Uh, uh, but the facts of the matter are that uh, in that passage that I read from you from the parable of the sower, the ability to see the mystery of God's love and to know it is for you, that Christ died for you, as long as we stand on that, everything is transformed. Now, there are all kinds of forces in the world that want to take that away. This Sunday, there are 100 in church, and next Sunday, there are 48. Oh, dear. You know, it's not hard for our security to be like the barometer uh, because we measure against the wrong things. What this passage is telling us, what he's telling the Ephesians and the churches in that river valley is wake up, wake up. Uh, you have been given a blessedness. You have been given an adoption. You have been given the forgiveness of sins. Uh, you belong to God. There is nothing that can separate you from that. Now, there's no promise that we won't have adversity. Uh, as I said yesterday, the, in the calling of the disciples, the promise was that the disciples would be given family a hundredfold with persecution. I want the first half of the deal, but not the second half, you see. Uh, and so what we are experiencing right now are some pretty hard times. And there's nothing unusual about that, but I don't believe there's a reason in the world for the difficulties of this present day to hold anything back as far as the vitality of the gospel is concerned. Uh, and I'm, I think as far as my work at All Saints Church, Chevy Chase, one of the things that I'm going to do day in and day out uh, is to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord uh, and count on the Holy Spirit uh, to use that. Uh, we, I had the privilege when I started preaching there in June that the lectionary in the American uh, church right now has had uh, the Gospel of Mark and that passage from John 6 and Mark 6, all of which were about the feeding of the 5,000, which is the only miracle that you find in all four of the, uh, of the Gospels. Uh, and the, uh, the amazing thing about uh, that, those miracles is that people had difficulty seeing. Uh, that's where that statement again about eyes that don't see and ears that don't hear. 
Jesus fed 5,000 uh, with five barley loaves and two small fishes. And what they thought was, well, here's a fellow who can feed us all the time. Let's make him king, you see. And that missed the mark profoundly uh, because what he was talking about uh, was an eternal food uh, that no one can take away uh, for, uh, the, for this life, for the age to come. Uh, and so the leadership, the spiritual leadership uh, in, the, in the parish church all need to gather the congregation around the Word of God, uh, the worship of God, the fellowship of God, and from that, an expression of the mercy of God out to the world. Uh, we don't do good works uh, in order to be good people, but we, they are the fruit, if you will, of the mercy of God in life. And all of that fits together. Uh, and so when we begin to talk about stewardship, I'd like for you to think about it in a holistic way. We have a profound stewardship as disciples of Jesus Christ. And the first stewardship we have uh, is a faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ to root it in our lives, to ask God for the grace to hear the gospel, uh, to stand on it, to share it, uh, and to be sure that in our congregations, our congregation life is built around that. Now, what I'd like for you to think about right now, we don't have any way uh, for people to have that kind of discussion here uh, in the church, but think about the ways in your parish church that you are exercising a stewardship of the gospel to root the gospel in the life of that congregation. Uh, and think about what you are doing uh, about that. For instance, how many of you all today are involved in Bible study? Okay. Praise God. Raise your hands higher so everybody can see. All right, Bishop, you see what's going on here? Anybody back here? Three saved back here in the choir. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, 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 the point being that, that rooting the people of God in the Word of God uh, is a, is a f fundamental issue uh, to what I would call our spiritual well-being. Uh, when I got the paper this morning, uh, I like to look through the paper for various and sundry things, uh, and there was an, an article in this morning's paper uh, that's one of these uh, researches that uh, reminded me when I was a college student at Sewanee, we had an English professor, Abbott Cotton Martin, uh, and he loved to play uh, games with the students, and uh, I didn't take his class until I was a senior, uh, and I, I can remember he would ask me, Mr. Salmon, and he would sort of ask me a question and I would answer it. And he would say, my, my, you have a firm grasp of the obvious. <laughs> <laughs> it was an uplifting moment, you understand. <laughs> but, uh, but I saw this article and the title of it is called A Psychologically Healthy Workplace is Essential. <laughs> well, uh, is, is there anything mysterious about that? <laughs> And, of course, I'm sure they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to find that, uh, find that out. But, uh, but my point is that uh, it says in here, placing a premium on employee psychological well-being is linked to higher productivity, better performance, et cetera. Uh, and he said uh, it's very important to protect the relationship between employee and employer. And I thought, well, you know, in terms of this article, one of the things that we know is that the spiritual well-being of every disciple and every congregation is fundamentally crucial. And we need to focus on that. Uh, I used to say to the clergy, I'm always blessed uh, because in the liturgy that you pray for the bishop. Uh, I also had groups of people in the diocese who prayed for me regularly and, and prayed with me regularly. And I can remember uh, one person who was asking me about that. And I said, well, you know, I suggest that, uh, that you pray for me because I affect your life profoundly and you might want to keep me straight. Uh, <laughs> and uh, one of the things that happens in the uh, church is that congregations talk about rectors, clergy talk about bishops. Uh, and we are the topic of conversation. Uh, and uh, what I'm driving at is the spiritual well-being of the headship uh, is profoundly influential. Uh, and so we could say the same thing about the church, and we don't need a, a, a research project in order to do that. The scripture tells us that quite 
profoundly. And then it talks about honesty uh, and transparency. Uh, what, it's, what it's driving at is that when you look at the person of Jesus Christ, there is no doubt about how much he loves us or that he would not tell us anything but the truth. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, I said to the Diocese of, of South Carolina one time, I don't believe Jesus Christ likes one of us, but I think he died for us, and that's another matter. Uh, because what that does is it describes love in the biblical sense of the word. You know, one of the difficulties we have is that all kinds of cultural understandings replace biblical teaching. And so one of the things that has really uh, been devastating to the church lately is our understanding of love, which in the modern sense of the word is usually goop or sentimental, uh, and it means doing what I want you to do, uh, and it means liking and all those kinds of things. But actually in the scripture, love is will. It's not feeling, it's will. And, and we, all, we all understand that. When I, um, I married Louise when I was at the university parish, uh, and some years later we moved to St. Louis, and um, we lived in the rectory right next to St. Michael and St. George, but the rectory uh, had uh, become slum-like uh, over the years, and so the uh, parish agreed to restore it. Uh, and I came up early and, and uh, lived in an apartment down the way. Uh, and uh, when Louise came up the summer with the two children, three and a half and one and a half, or four and two, uh, the second night we were in the uh, rectory, uh, I was sleeping away because I sleep soundly, and she punched me and she said, Ed, I heard a noise downstairs. Somebody's downstairs. I said, Louise, I didn't hear anything. She said, somebody's down there. See, we were in a new three-story house not knowing anything. Somebody's downstairs. Go check on it. So I got up, uh, and I started downstairs and stepped on Edward's car and <laughs> fell down the steps. And if love were feeling, I'd have swapped off the whole tribe. <laughs> but thank God, love is will, you know? <laughs> And that's, that's what the Holy Scripture teaches us. And that is, uh, that's what it means by Jesus willfully mounting the arms of the cross. So you see, when a congregation stays rooted in the gospel, it gives us a way of dealing with the world. It lets us see it in a, in, in through the eyes of Christ. And it's through those eyes that everything looks different. Uh, and so one of the fundamental stewardships we have in every congregation is to stay rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, to be empowered by the worship of God, uh, to be empowered by fellowship that lets this root so that we can go out and witness to the world. In other words, in one sense of the word, this church is like an incubator. Uh, what it does is it empowers disciples. It keeps them warm so they can go out and witness to Jesus Christ. Isn't that what that's all about? You know? Uh, and, and bless us to do that. So any congregation, on the one hand, that doesn't stay rooted in the Scripture is going to go blind, or another word would be benign, uh, and move from what I would call active discipleship to building maintenance. Uh, and when a congregation does that, we're always concerned about how to keep things going. Uh, I told the clergy yesterday that when I was uh, graduated from seminary and went back to the Diocese of Arkansas in order to take my canonicals, the bishop had a question that he asked every uh, seminarian who wanted to be ordained a deacon. And of course, by the time I got there, the apocryphal process had passed that question down to everybody. Uh, so you knew the answer when he asked you. Uh, and he said, I can, he didn't say Ed, he said, my boy. That's what he always said, my boy. He said, if your church burned down, what would you do? What would be the first thing you'd do? And I said, Bishop, if my church burned down, first thing I'd do is take up an offering for mission. Now, that was the right answer, but that was the answer he expected. And so we all knew that, and everybody told him that, and he was happy as a bed bug. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but where did he get that? He got that from the gospel of Jesus Christ that says when things are tough, 
What you don't do is retrench. You don't react. What you do is you get missionary. People who get missionary are not navel gazers. People who are missionary uh, live with a different kind of power than people who are trying to be protective, people who are conservators. Uh, and uh, that's very clearly something that we get from the New Testament uh, when we see that th there were plenty of problems in the New Testament, just as many problems in the New Testament church as we've got in the church today. Uh, but the answer is, what do you do uh, when you have problems? And that is, you stand on the Word of God, and then you do mission in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, and when you do that, everything looks different. And it doesn't make any difference what size the place is. When I graduated from Virginia Theological Seminary, and before that exam, the year summer before, I was assigned to St. John's Church in Harrison, Arkansas, where Christoph Keller was the rector and then later was elected uh, Bishop of, of, uh, of Arkansas. Uh, and uh, when I got there and got to know the people in that congregation, there was a man there who, uh, who owned the little bank in town, the First National Bank. His name was Raby Rhodes. Uh, and there weren't many Episcopalians in the upper part of Arkansas in the Ozarks. Folks just didn't go up that way a lot unless they, you know, lived out on the mountains. And here was this little town of Harrison, Arkansas. Raby was an Episcopalian, went up there, uh, had a zeal for the Lord and, and for the church. Uh, and uh, as that area been, began to grow and they built the dams and the lakes up in the, uh, in the mountains, one of the things that he did was he went on a hunt for Episcopalians. Uh, and... Uh, and Raby loved the Lord and loved that church. And I mean, he'd get in the car and he'd heard new people moved in here and there. And he'd go out. When people came into the bank to start banking there, first thing he'd say is, what church do you go to? He said, I'm an Episcopalian. I go to St. John's Church. And you know, that kind of witness uh, in a very small town uh, helped that church to grow and to build a new church and to build a parish hall and do all kinds of things. And they, they were just a handful of people, but it was the zeal of the Lord uh, in that life and others, and there were significant others that, that did the same thing. Uh, I, I remember, though, the, if you've ever been to the uh, Ozarks, uh, there's a lost valley uh, not far from Harrison, and you really can't drive in it. It really is lost. Uh, and there are, there are people almost uh, uh, with an Elizabethan heritage, people who've been in the mountains forever, uh, and uh, some of them sit on the front porch, as you know, and they hunt and do all kinds of things. And, and Raby was uh, out looking for this new family that had moved up there from Texas. And this old, old Archie was sitting on the front porch whittling or whatever he's doing. And, and uh, he said, the fellow said, what you doing up here? And he said, uh, he said I'm out, out looking for Episcopalians. And the man scratched his head and he said, I don't believe I've ever shot one. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you, can see, you can see that that's what I call a missionary you see uh, and uh, there's not any re regardless of the size of the church do you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ has blessed you in that place where you worship and the wonderful heritage where people have been baptized and married and buried uh, and cared for for generations do you think that that place is not a place of power? Uh, and instead of being a conservator of it and worrying about it, the only thing we need to be concerned about is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that will empower any congregation. And so we have a, a fundamental stewardship uh, as disciples, uh, and that fundamental stewardship is to stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ, to root our lives uh, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, and to be involved in mission uh, from the day we're born till the day we die. Uh, the reason I'm here is that I'm interested in mission. I think as Anglicans, we need to care about each other all over the world. And I've had stunning gifts of being with Anglican Christians and other Christians, but Anglican Christians from all over the world who have blessed me in ways that you can't, that you can't realize. Uh, Th thank you. Is that just water? <laughs> I thought I'd ask. You never know. <laughs>
Um, at, at, at any rate, the point is, we are in tough times, but so what? That's what Ephesians says. So what? What's new about that? Uh, and what we don't want to do as Christians is to retrench, uh, to, uh, to start cutting back, uh, to um, react. What we want to do is get the world to react to us like Raby did, get in his car uh, and go out and, and do the mission of, uh, of the Lord. Uh, but you can't, that will not happen if you and the church are not rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it won't happen uh, if you just read the Bible, uh, tip your hat to worship, uh, and believe you're in charge of the world. It won't happen that way. Because what the scripture does is it lets us bend the knee in front of the one who emptied himself for us, and that changes, changes everything. Now, that also says to me that one of the concerns that every congregation needs to have in terms of the stewardship of the gospel is how we deal with our children uh, and how we deal with the children of the community. In the first assignment I had, I had four churches, uh, St. Andrews Rogers, St. Thomas Springdale, uh, St. James Eureka Springs, and Grace Church Siloam, which met in the Methodist chapel of the Methodist church. Uh, and we talked about starting a Sunday school after I'd been there for a while in St. James Eureka Springs, which was a town of retirement age people for the most part. Uh, and I said to the vestry, we need to start a Sunday school. And uh, they said, we don't have any children. Why would we start a Sunday school? And I had a couple of retired people there, Francis Donovan and some others who had been teachers. And I persuaded them to help us uh, start a Sunday school, and we announced the Sunday school, uh, and when we started it, we had seven children. Now, why didn't we have any children? Because we didn't have a Sunday school. But we didn't have a Sunday school because we didn't have any children. Now, notice the attitudes. Notice the attitudes. Uh, and so, uh, anybody who is in standing on the self-emptying love of Jesus Christ needs to be empowered and proactive rather than reactive. We need to take risks. The word that defines the work of Jesus Christ in the scripture is the word risk. He emptied himself. Congregations that don't take risks don't go anywhere, and they decline. Uh, and it doesn't make any difference how small a congregation you are. What could you do in your community that would startle everybody and say, what's going on down there? You know? uh, and that's one of the things that the gospel is all about. Uh, letting people see how the power of God in the Holy Spirit can transform life. Uh, and the, the fundamental stewardship we have as Christian people is the stewardship of that gospel. And with children from one generation to another to pass that precious heritage on, uh, and so one of the things that you all need to do as stewards of the gospel is to ask the question, how are you passing that gospel on to this generation and the next generation? And what are you doing about it? Are you satisfied with that? Uh, I can tell you that I've had a rule of thumb about my own ministry uh, since I had a good spiritual director and have had most of my life. And my rule of thumb is nothing is as good as it can be. Nothing is as good as it can be. We can always do it better and do more. Uh, and once, once you get that attitude in place, uh, things begin to happen. Uh, and so what, what, can, what are the possibilities? Uh, and so what I, I think the gospel message would ask you to do about your congregations is to take stock, and we'll do that uh, when we talk about uh, forming uh, the, the, uh, the church, uh, the stewardship of the, of the church and, and its leadership. But in terms of children and the gospel, how are you passing that on from one generation to the next? Uh, anybody can do that who has a heart for it. Uh, anybody can do that. Age is not a factor. Uh, I had a, um, a priest who was our chaplain at the Citadel in uh, 
uh, in Charleston, uh, and he was remarkably good. Students there regarded him almost as a, uh, as a father figure. Uh, and uh, he uh, came to me one day and, and he said, Bishop, I've got a serious problem. They're going to have to amputate my leg, uh, and um, uh, I, th I need to resign. And uh, so I said, well, uh, if you just had one leg, would you still want to be a priest? And he said, well, certainly. And I said, well, then get to work. <laughs> you know? that nothing stands in the way of that wonderful gift that God had given to him. You can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with one leg. Uh, and there are all kinds of people. You know, uh, it, the, the impediments that we think we have, the power of God can transform all of that. And so when we begin to think about, uh, about renewal, there's absolutely nothing standing in your way, according to what Ephesians has to say, that prevents you from standing on that grace of God and asking God to transform your life and mine and your congregation and seeing what the Holy Spirit will do about that. Nothing stands in the way of that. You don't have to wait for the diocese to do anything. You don't have to wait for new committees to do anything. The only thing we need to do is stand on that precious gift of God's love in Jesus Christ. And the other thing uh, that we need to do is to understand that regardless of the circumstances, the answer is always the same. Do missions. Proclaim Jesus. It doesn't make any difference if the church is burned down. Uh, it doesn't make any difference if the church is declined. It doesn't make any difference if the roof leaks. Uh, it just doesn't matter. We have only one thing to do, and that is stand on the grace of God in Jesus Christ and, and to proclaim that. When we ask God for the grace to do that, I'll guarantee you that no congregation will look, ever look the same again. And when we get into this afternoon, we'll talk a little bit about uh, transformation and, uh, and where it comes from. But the first thing, that I'm trying to say to you about the renewal of the church is there is a stewardship, a fundamental stewardship, and that fundamental stewardship is the gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the Holy Scripture, the church, its worship, its fellowship. Uh, upon that is, the, uh, is placed the empowerment of God and life is transformed and changed. And if we stand on that, uh, there's no telling uh, what can be done. Now, I'm counting on that, you know, in Chevy Chase because we've got a lot of work to do. And one of the things that's going to save me is that I don't believe I have to do it. See, one of the problems we have as leaders is that we sometimes think we're saviors. Uh, and then if we're saviors, then we're responsible for everybody. The thing that I'm responsible to do is to take the risk of leading that congregation and hold up the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and let the Holy Spirit move. Uh, and to tell people the truth. Uh, and, and in doing so, I'm quite content with whatever comes there. Uh, and maybe in a, in a year, I'll send uh, the archbishop a, a letter and let him tell you what's happened. And if I don't like it, I'll be a, it'll be a short letter. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not worried. I don't worry about God. I don't worry about Jesus. I only ask God for the grace to be faithful. In other words, the attitude that we bring to ministry is is so important. If you think you've got to do it, forget it. If you're willing to let the Holy Spirit work through you, there is no limit to what can happen in your life and in, and in the life of the church. And I'm counting. I'm counting on that uh, because I have, I have seen it in my life now for almost 50 years what God through the Holy Spirit has been able to do that I couldn't possibly tackle, wouldn't even consider it, and it's absolutely amazing uh, the things that happen and, the, and the, how the Holy Spirit works uh, in, uh, in lives and the things that happen to people when you just keep before them uh, what I would call the possibilities that God has for your life and, and mine. You know, one of the, one of the saddest things that, that you can see, uh, because in a, over the years I haven't as bishop, but when I was in the last two churches that were rather large, I had a lot of funerals. Uh, and uh, one of the things that you see at funerals are what I would call blessed lives that have affected and, and blessed so many people. And then you see uh, lives that, uh, that bore little fruit or sad fruit. 
uh, we can entrust that to God and, and, uh, and, and, and trust, trust in his mercy. But, you know, when you, when you baptize a baby and all the future is before them, and then when you bury somebody and you see what's happened to that gift, but the thing that I'm asking you all is, right now, it's never too late. It's never too late to think about what God has given you and what you can do about that in your life for his sake. Because the stewardship of the gospel of Jesus Christ is one of the most precious things as Christians that you've been given. Uh, and so that's where we need to start uh, with the renewal of the church. So let me stop there for a minute. Uh, and see if you have any questions or anything that you'd like to say back to me uh, since I'm up here doing all the talking. Uh, I'd be glad to respond to anything. I don't, my watch is broken, so I'm trying to keep up with the time. Yeah. Anybody want to say anything back to me? Yes, sir. Bishop, uh, just thank you for your words, first of all. Thank you very much. Um, Let me see what this is before you... It's okay. Good. It's, uh, I mean, I, I grew up in this church, actually sitting in this pew. That pew? Yeah. And, uh, and I got to tell you, like, I'm, I'm with you with everything. But we, we've had hundreds of years of inertia in non-risk taking. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about tr transformation is great. Uh, but we've got a, how do you change hundreds of years of inertia in not taking risks? Mm -hmm. uh, just because we've decided now we're interested in it. Yeah, well, uh, I don't think that it's a question of us now being interested in it. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, that inertia is the same thing that our Lord was dealing with, which is the reason he was crucified, uh, quite frankly, because none of us likes, likes to change. Uh, but somebody uh, asked me the uh, question yesterday about, you know, instead of been preaching, uh, and... Uh, People don't seem to be responding to the message. Uh, and one of the things that I said was, do you hold them accountable for that? Because if you remember yesterday when we talked about transformation, one of the things that I'm doing is holding people accountable for that. Uh, and then we talk about that. Uh, if you don't talk about the inertia, um, for instance, if there are things that you'd like for this congregation to change, if you could be descriptive of that uh, and not be a put down. In other words, nobody needs to be put down because we've all agreed to that anyway. Uh, and so what we're talking about is the hardest thing in the world. And the hardest thing in the world is to change a tacit contract. contract. If you made a contract with somebody, wrote it out and signed it, uh, you could have the attorney co contact him and say, we've got this contract, but we'd like to change it. And you could do that. If you make a tacit contract with somebody that is not written down and you want to change it, there's a biblical word, word for it, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> We've always done it that way. Or uh, one of the things that I was prepared for when I went to All Saints is what about the Christmas pageant? We've always had it at such and such a point. Now, nobody has signed that contract but in every congregation, there are tacit contracts around. And one of the tacit contracts that you'll find in every congregation is that people have decided uh, to behave in a certain way and nobody has said anything to the contrary to the point that they were willing to call their hand on it. Uh, and, and so if you want something to change, then you need to call the hand on it in a gracious but firm way. And so one of the things that, uh, that I'm about uh, at All Saints is calling people's hands on things. Uh, and uh, as I told you yesterday, uh, I met with uh, two men who are in charge of the acolytes. Uh, and I said to them, uh, do you know, I've got this list of people that nobody knows. Do you know families that uh, are not here now that you know? Oh, yes, they said. And I said, well, who, for instance? And they told me a couple of names. I said, call them up. Uh, and then after you call them up, get in touch with me and I'll go see them. But now, see, nobody has ever asked them to call up anybody who's not there. Uh, if you disappear from the church, everybody thinks that, you, you know, that uh, the second coming has happened and you've just gone somewhere. Uh, and there, there's nothing more, how I want to say it, painful 
if you're a parishioner to disappear and nobody cares. Nobody cares. And so one of the things about inertia is if the leadership is willing to collude with it, you will have it forever. And I'm not willing to collude with it. Could it get expensive? Yes, it could. Are you willing to pay the price in order to deal with it? Is new life worth it? Yes, it is. But in dealing with it, even if it's expensive, you don't uh, denigrate people, you don't attack people, you don't declare people to be bad because we've already colluded with that. But what we have to do is name it. If you can't name it, it owns you. You can count on it. If there's something that you can't talk to somebody about, whatever that is is in charge of your relationship. It affects the way everything functions. Uh, and so um, in terms of the proclamation of the gospel, uh, in terms of its ownership, one of the things that that requires of us as ordained leadership is to ask God to give us the grace to hold people accountable for, what, for who we are and what we are, whose we are and what we are. And that's a little bit ticklish business because congregations get set in their ways, don't they? I mean, not these congregations, but some, you know, some congregations get set in their ways. All right. Uh, any other thing? The, yes, ma'am. You're talking about risk taking? Risk taking, yes. Well, there were two ladies in our church. We have a, a little church, a little gray church opposite our Boston Hospital. Uh huh. Declining, as all of our churches are. So two ladies said, why don't we have a soup song? We'll make some soup, serve it in the kitchen, and have free will donation and, and advertise it. So mm -hmm. uh, it started off, we had 25 people, and we made $50, $60. That was last January. As of uh, last week, we have made $4,000, and we had 71 people coming. How wonderful. We have 10 new people coming yeah. every week. And as you do that, just stay up for a minute. I, I think that's a, that's a marvelous testimony. Now, uh, is there some message that you would like to give to the 71? Well, we welcome them. Uh-huh. And uh, if you don't have any money, you don't pay any money. Uh -huh. The food is there. Uh-huh. And we tell them, well, we just tell them they, they love us and we love them. Uh-huh. And what, ab what about throwing Jesus in that mix? <laughs> it's in our church hall, so... <laughs> yeah, no, but you see, what... Uh -huh. No, well, you see, you know that I know that you know that I know. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let, me, let me make a suggestion to you that, uh, that you do with what you will. Why don't you, uh, why don't you put, uh, put a sign up or something that says, that gives him the impression that you are representing our Lord? And not just the fact that, that the building is, belongs to the church. Can I make a suggestion? Maybe they could have napkins with uh, Christ loves you or something. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And then talking about going forward, and, and we got discouraged this week. We're getting a new uh, roofing on our uh -huh. house, on our thing, on our hall. And we had uh, some people volunteering, and we had last Wednesday night, because they were there Tuesday morning, we had 23 bundles stolen at $26 a bundle. And my friend said, oh, I am so discouraged. We worked so hard. And I said, I, I don't think we should get discouraged. No. That makes us yeah. get more bundles. And right. And you will get more bundles. Do you have insurance? It may be covered. <laughs> it may be covered. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what I'm interested in is just this wonderful exchange. In other words, this good work. One of the things that we want to do in the work that we do is, is not assume that people see Jesus unless we, unless we announce it. So uh, maybe in the next period of time, somehow or other, you can get him in the middle of it uh, so that un people understand that this is not just out of the goodness of your heart, but it's through what our Lord has done for you. And you see, if we can do that, then that begins to add a little, little more to it. Uh, how big is the community you live in? Uh, our hospital is about 5,000 men on the base. Uh huh. On the base of the family. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. there are seven families. Mm -hmm. In 1951, there were 50 families there. There must be, I don't know, I really don't know. Uh huh. Uh huh.
Uh, anybody there that doesn't go to church? <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> I'm wondering though what what you all might do to just reach out uh, and invite some people to your wonderful fellowship. In other words. When you stop and think about so many of our parishes, one of the things that blesses them is that we have a, a family of long standing uh, that people long to be a part of. Uh, and I'm wondering if there are not some ways that, uh, that you could get that word out. Maybe call up a few people. Uh, and uh, in other words, and, and for us, energize. In other words, when I've talked to the clergy about people working together, uh, you, you'll need encouragement to do that. We all need encouragement. So if we could stand behind you and think out loud about it, uh, in this conversation, one of the things that we got on the table was something that we wouldn't have gotten on the table if we hadn't had the conversation. And then we can move from there to empower it more. And so you see what we can do for each other. Size has nothing to do with it, as you know. Well, thank you very much. God bless you. I'm going to check on you. <laughs> I'm going to call up the Archbishop and say, now tell me about that supper, you know. <laughs> All right, in, anything else that anybody wants to ask or testify about? Would, yes, sir. We're, we're in a culture historically where people, people want to go on Sunday mornings <laughs> and then return home. And how do we make disciples when no one will come to a study group for very few how do we teach them? Well, I would say the answer to that is slowly, but with excitement. Uh, for instance, one of the things that uh, I think that uh, can happen to us is oftentimes our leadership is dedicated but muted. And in terms of the risk, one of the things that uh, I'm uh, unashamed to say to people is that, uh, you know, we have such and such a Bible class. Uh, and you're missing something because one of the things that it does is it helps you to see life in an entirely different way. Uh, and if, you, if you're not here, you've really lost something. And I wouldn't hesitate to say that to anybody. Uh, <laughs> well, I might just ask them to come. Or, in other words, I don't know your people well enough to know what approach I would take to them. But I would, uh, uh, I, my approach would be based on how, how long have you been there? Ten years. Okay. So they believe that they don't have to come. Is that right? Well, they're too busy. They're distracted. <laughs> they're, not, they're not too busy. Um, the, um, I used to go to the Menninger Foundation in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, and um, uh, one time we were doing an analysis of our ministry. Uh, and uh, I said, you know, I didn't have time to do something. And the uh, leader of the group uh, said, did somebody have a gun on you? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, people do exactly what they want to do. Uh, it has nothing to do with time. It has to do with the, the, what I call the world view and how we fit in it. And that's one of the things that I'd want to begin to say to people uh, because the prize they are getting is not impressive. Uh, uh, but you see, I, what I would suggest to you is that while you haven't been able to get any leverage on it, uh, they have agreed with you and you have agreed with them that I can't do anything about that. I want to. Uh, and so they've taken that as a contract. Uh, and so what you'll be about now is trying to figure out some ways to change that contract. And that goes on all the time. I'm constantly trying to figure out ways to change contracts. So it might be that what you'd want to do is get somebody to come in beside you and talk to them. In other words, if we could get the diocese to the point where people who had gifts to do certain things could learn to help each other uh, get things going, it, it would be amazing. Um, and, and so we might, we might talk about that in some of the breaks about some ways that we've used to do that. But it's no different from the question that I had up here about inertia. Uh, and and, 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 and it, is, it is profound. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we're going to have to figure out how to do is how to change a number of tacit contracts that are in congregations and help each other do that. Yes, sir. Bishop, what are the pros and cons of starting with uh, Bible versus uh, Christian action in the community at large? Well, uh, I would tell you that I would never 
first start with Christian action because when you have people who believe that they can earn their relationship to God, you've just given them the tools. And the other thing that I would say to you is, if you will start with, with, the, with the scripture, which demands Christian action, which doesn't make it optional, uh, that's the foundation upon which all Christian action should be done. Uh, one of the things that the Anglican Church suffers from is that we have a lot of people who are doing good works, uh, and thank God they're doing it. But they couldn't put that together with the gospel of Jesus Christ if their lives depended on it. And so the witness is muted. And remember that the first witness we have is to carry the cross of Jesus Christ because that brings life. And there isn't any disciple who has life that's not going to go out and do good works. Not one. If that makes sense to you. Uh, work. Uh, to a, a person who has no theological context is like whiskey to a drunk. It makes them believe that they really are somebody uh, and they've hit a home run. And the good news is, regardless of that intentional system, people are blessed, uh, but they are also cheated. And what they're cheated of is the, is the ultimate gift. If you remember uh, in the parable of the, uh, of the lepers, remember when Jesus healed the lepers and and uh, God knows he told them to go to the priest and get a, a, a bill of cleansing. Uh, and one came back and knelt at his feet. You, when, you, when, you, when you think about the startling contrast uh, in that setting, where ten people who were absolutely unclean and an anathema to their culture, that nobody wanted to be around, you couldn't even be around them when the wind was blowing in your direction, they were healed by Jesus and they went to get a bill of cleansing so that they could be whole human beings uh, again. That in itself was monumental, but one came back and knelt at the feet of Jesus, which was a sign of acknowledging his lordship, and he hit a home run. He got them both. Got them both. The others missed the big boat. It was a huge boat, but they missed the big one. Uh, and that's what happens to us in the church over and over and over again. We missed the big boat. Uh, and what we're talking about is how to get the big boat. Uh, get first things first. Uh, I'm not sure where we are with time, Your Grace. Uh, we're, uh, I think we have it. Our lunch is at 12.30. It's now 11.30. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want to stretch for 10 minutes and... Yeah, let's take a stretch and we'll... Uh, let's take a 15-minute stretch. Uh, I think I've told you everything I know about that subject. <laughs>